The first time I went downhill skiing was when I was 24 years old because, well, <laughs> growing up a winter sport athlete, that sort of thing is strictly prohibited. At the start of the day, I could really barely make it down the bunny hill while just, you know, pizza wedging the entire way down. And um, after a formal lesson and some, you know, chances to watch and emulate other more experienced skiers throughout the day, within a couple of hours, it was pretty amazing to be able to, you know, actually sort of gingerly carve my way down one of the, the easier black diamonds um, and stay in one piece. But needless to say, over the course of the day, I fell <laughs> a lot. Uh, I remember partway through the day, I was kind of getting a little overconfident and I saw this little cutoff trail between two of the slopes and um, it kind of went right underneath the ski lift. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go over there. I'm going to show everybody on the ski lift how cool I am. <laughs> and I, so I like kind of turned and pointed both my skis right down that direction and just picked up all of this speed. And I'm like just on the edge of losing control. I don't know if you've ever seen a skateboarder get speed wobbles, but that's exactly what it looked like. I was like, whoa. And like, I could just feel everyone's eyes off from the ski lift, just like looking like this kid is going to break his neck. So by some miracle, I stay up. And right as I go to jet across this gap, both of the tips of my skis catch in two feet of fresh powder and stop immediately. And meanwhile, I'm like ejected out of my skis and just land face first into a big pile of snow. And literally, I could just imagine what everybody on the ski lifts are thinking. Like all you could see, it looked like a cartoon. It was only like my lower half sticking straight out of the air. Like you just saw two legs sticking out of a snowbank. <laughs> so I think we could all probably relate to a time where we've either been embarrassed or you know, really frustrated just trying to learn a new skill. And it doesn't really matter if you're just caring about sports performance or if you just want to like lead a satisfactory life. Like, you know, learning and acquiring new skills is crucial to that process. You know, whether it's just like, you know, I want to RX a workout so that I can be at a box with my friends and be involved in that community. Or uh, I want to learn how to go skiing so I can have fun with my family. You know, these things are crucial to life. So today, my goal is to teach you how to learn any CrossFit skill. Hey, it's Ben Wise, and this is The Fitness Movement. The Fitness Movement is brought to you by Soar Fitness. Soar Fitness is my company and my platform to deliver training content to coaches and athletes like you. The site has educational resources on everything from program design and exercise physiology to skill progressions and movement breakdowns. And in terms of programming, we have our online training program, The Protocol, and I also offer one-on-one -on -one remote coaching. It's all at one place, swerfitness.com. And welcome back to my rant on skill development. So the outline of today's show I want to go over um, sample skill sessions for four common movements that just pose people a lot of issues when they're trying to learn them um, that are specific to CrossFit. So this is going to be handstand walking, double unders, ring muscle ups, and barbell cycling. After I go over each of the sample sessions for those movements, I just want to talk about it a little bit. As I'm talking about it, I'm going to apply different principles that I use in these sample sessions that are principles of motor learning. So I'm going to pull, you know, three or four potential principles from each of those movements. Um, and there's actually 10 total principles that we'll be going over. So anytime I refer to motor learning, it's just, you know, learning new skills with your body, right? So it's learning skills as it um, applies to a physicality. So let's dive into it. First, I want to go over handstand walking. And for each of these movements, I'm going to give an avatar. So basically, who is the fake person that this program's written for and that would be appropriate for? And I want to give that first because that is an important thing for context. So the avatar for this handstand walking skill progression, this is a person who has an adequate overhead strength, right? Um, I'm saying here that they can do at least two to three strict handstand push-ups. Just where we know, like, you know, the strength component is not going to be a big limiter um, when we're talking about their ability to be able to support themselves upside down and being inverted. Um, also, this person has minimal inversion exposure. So yes, they've done things like handstand push-ups, but they haven't just spent a lot of time being upside down um, and being really comfortable on their hands. They haven't really developed that yet. They can kick up, do a few handstand push-ups, but they're not super confident in like good clean body lines and that thing when they're upside down. And then lastly is that they're experiencing minor you know, some amount of fear of falling. However, it's not preventing them from actually making attempts. Um, 
So we'll, you'll see that we do some things that are involving being inverted and kind of moving in different ways and learning how to get out of the movement correctly. Um, that's not going to hurt you. Uh, just giving, kind of giving them some exposures of that so that they can get more and more comfortable of getting out of a handstand um, or a handstand walk. So let's go over these uh, skill sample sessions. I actually have two of them that I pulled from. I have an entire progression. So first of all, um, I'll read this first one. And I'll explain where you can kind of view the entire spreadsheet. I pulled this from week three, day two, and that's not super important. Just understand that um, this is part of a bigger progression. Um, the first two movements are flip flop back and forth. Um, these are supersetted. It's an elevated cat pose, which is just opening up your overhead position. And then that's supersetted with an supersetted with an L sit plate overhead hold. The thing when you hold a plate over your head, especially if you're seated on the floor with your feet out in front of you, it demands a lot of like hip flexors in like your um, anterior of your body. So basically think of like, abs, hip flexors like that, those structures. And then also obviously requires you to have an open shoulder. So it's not kind of out in front of you. The other thing that I really like about this L sit plate overhead hold is that it puts your wrist into extension, right? So it's an actual open hand movement. Um, unlike something like a barbell where you have your hand close, because that's obviously a fundamental difference between that and something like a handstand is that your hand is open. And a lot of people really don't have that great of wrist mobility when they're overhead. So we do things that are involving, you know, wrist stretches and like mo mobilizations and strengthening things in the other sessions. But here it's more just focused on that overhead position and that body line tying into that. Um, that's just sort of a warm up. B is weight shifts. So you're kicking up onto the wall. You could do this facing the wall or having uh, your heels against the wall, like you're doing a handstand push up. but it's weight shifts. Either way, um, you're thinking about shifting your weight from one hand to the other, but basically you're thinking about initiating that from your hips. So your hips sort of slide back and forth on the wall. And then as a result, you're able to deload the one hand. Then it's just two sets of that. That shouldn't take a long period of time. And then you'll go into your shoulder taps. Shoulder taps are the exact same thing, um, except you're actually moving your hand off the floor. So it's a, it requires a little bit more stability, a little bit more balance, a little bit more ability to be able to get all of your weight onto one hand and to really be able to close the gap from like your bicep to your ear on that hand that's supporting you. Next is actually handstand walk attempts. So again, with the things with the weight shifts and the shoulder taps is that it mimics handstand walking because in order to handstand walk successfully, you have to be able to shift your weight from one hand to the other and back and know how to move with that from your hips, especially handstand walk attempts after that, because you're trying to mimic that as closely as you can. Um, I want eight to 10 unfatigued attempts there as best quality as you possibly can. And then it's just some uh, additional, basically, uh, positional work after that. So we have an offset handstand hold where you kick up into like a handstand push up, but only one hand is on a bumper plate. So basically, you're kind of cockeyed, um, and you have to be able to feel that out and uh, you know feel how that changes your how your weight is distributed between your hands as a result of that. Again, because that's what you're gonna feel when you're handstand walking. And then it's just mobility after that, an elevated cat pose for your overhead, and a dip stretch for shoulder extension. So again, if you're someone who's listening to this and you want to visualize it, I have an entire spreadsheet for all of these skill progressions in the show notes. And by the way, it's much more than I'm actually just ha like kind of reading to you guys here. Um, it's actually built out for, you know, oftentimes six or eight weeks, um, especially for the, the ring muscle up one and the handstand walking one. I have entire skill progressions there that are honestly stuff that I could probably charge for. Um, so check that out. Those are all in the show notes. Um, zorfitness.com slash podcast slash zero 57 to check out the show notes and to view that spreadsheet. I'll link to it there. Next is week five, day one. Um, so just another skill session here. Um, you're going to start with a handstand static hold on the wall. So you're accumulating two minutes total, but I want to make sure I have like a little note here that this is prep work. It's not maximal holds. So again, come off before you get really tired or fatigued. Um, and then also each time you come off the wall, I want the athlete alternating between facing the wall and having their heels against the wall. One of the things, if you're facing the wall, typically what happens is that your feet are really like kind of like not to the tipping point where it'd be like if you kicked up into a handstand, but didn't get all the way to vertical. Um, and as a result, it kind of often will put people into a little bit more of a hollow body type position where you think about it, if you like started to do a wall walk and then stopped halfway up, sort of what that body line encourages um, for, again, if you're really focused on it, it's more of a hollow body um, type position versus if you kick up and have your heels against the wall, like it's a handstand push up. 
that tends to feel like it's past the tipping point where you've sort of kicked up and now you're you're going past that. You're almost falling. It would be like if you were falling almost towards doing a forward roll, but obviously the wall's there and it stops you. So um, the body line for those two things are completely different. Um, I think that the heels to the wall actually mimics a handstand walk more because in a handstand walk, you have to get past the tipping point and then sort of chase your heels, almost let your body weight start to fall forward, like almost like running. If anyone's ever seen like pose method drills where they kind of have the people wait, like almost like start to fall forward and lean before they start to move their feet and run. Um, it's the exact same thing, uh, the principle wise that happens here in terms of a tipping point and kind of letting gravity lead the movement that happens in the handstand walk. So you start with the static holds, then they're going to be doing lateral wall walks, or you could call this like a, you know, back and forth handstand walk with your feet on the wall. So basically you, you know, you kick up or do a wall walk into it. Again, depends if you're facing or having your heels against, but you walk like you know, five feet one way, five feet back, and that's sort of your set. So you do uh, two sets of that. Next is a handstand kick up into a forward roll. So you kick up like you're gonna do a static handstand hold, and then you tuck your chin and roll through um, into a forward roll. Again, this is just teaching not just, you know, overall body awareness, but also like how to fail a handstand walk correctly and not hurt yourself. Um, again, because this person is experiencing some level of fear or anxiety of being upside down and practicing this. Next is a cartwheel progression, just because, again, I think it's really helpful to get more exposure being upside down in different environments and to be able to feel what it needs to feel like to have a completely locked out elbow in a really solid, stable um, overhead position. Then it's actually going into your handstand walk attempts, five and a clock with completely unfatigued reps, making sure you rest fully between each attempt. And then lastly, it's a two minute T-spine opener. Okay, so let's go over some principles of motor learning that we can pull from this. Our first principle is intention and focus. Uh, Jeff Baltimore, I had him on the show, episode number 22. He said, not everyone can be given the same prescription and have the same result. Again, we were talking about something else actually unrelated to this here, but I think it also applies to something like motor learning as well. Um, and it just applies to training in general. There's a number of reasons why that can be the case, why you can give two people the exact same number uh, of sets and reps and the exact same specifics in terms of drills. And one's going to adapt quickly. The other one will adapt slowly. Obviously, there's things like genetic components that play a role, but also it comes down to things like intention and focus. Like if you have one athlete and they're going through those two skill sessions that I just gave and the one is kind of talking with their friend in between sets, um, you know, maybe they're, they're checking their phone, they're emailing someone, you know, just like from being bombarded by whatever's popping up in terms of notification from their phone. And we have, you know, someone else who is very high intention, really focused, is doing everything they can to be engaged in the movement and is sort of, you know, thinking about how they can, you know, change their body line or like all these things being engaged in the actual practice in between sets and while they're resting as well, not just when they're actually upside down. Think about who's going to adapt quicker there. Like the person who is actually putting all that mental energy into that and focus, they're just going to adapt so much quicker. So to me, I think focus and having really high intention when you're doing and practicing these skills is sort of the foundation and the foundational requirement really for all the other uh, fundamental principles to actually be able to work effectively. And then principle number two is making errors. Nelson Mandela said, quote, I never fail. I win or I learn. So I think high performers in all areas, uh, except maybe like skydiving, like they understand that failure is a necessary part of the learning process. You know, I think humans are just sort of naturally adverse to, you know, wanting to make errors when they're starting something. And and I'm not saying that you should intentionally make errors. Um, what I'm saying is that errors are a crucial part of how to learn a skill. So in order for you to be able to correctly identify the components that are necessary for a skill to be executed correctly, that process can't happen unless you make some mistakes along the way. So for example, if we use this handstand walk um, skill example, um, when you go up to kick up for a handstand walk, again, I talked before about that balance point that you have to find. If you don't get high enough, you don't never make it to the balance point. You're never actually going to get your feet over top of your body and never going to actually move anywhere with your hands. Your momentum will never actually travel. If you kick up too quickly and you uh, go past the tipping point too quickly, then you're going to basically fall over and kind of tumble into a forward roll. 
there's a sweet spot in between there. The only way that you're ever going to find that sweet spot and be able to recognize it and feel it when you're inverted is when you've done that a number of times and you know that, okay, that's too far. That's not far enough. Okay. That's my sweet spot. Right. And the more times that you actually make errors on either side of that, you're going to be able to feel that quicker and identify it faster and you'll be able to get more consistent and more precise about how you kick up. And you know, when do you like, how far do you kick up in terms of like, how far do I place my hands in front of my feet? How aggressively do I have to kick up, um, into my handstand? How fast do I move my hands? Um, do I wait a little bit? Like all those little things start to impact how you can think about a movement and you can identify it quicker when you actually make mistakes. In my experience watching athletes, the athletes with the greatest skill also have the best ability to be able to detect rep over rep inconsistencies. So they can tell you, oh, I rushed that pull in my ring muscle up by just a fraction of a second. And that's why it kind of felt a little bit weird. And I caught it off um, where they could tell you like, oh yeah, I jumped my feet back just an inch in that snatch. And that's why I really had to kind of rip it back with my shoulders. I was standing up out of the hole or, um, you know, I could feel in my legs that I was getting a little bit less springy and reactive off the ground in my double unders. And that, you know, I just had to get a little bit crisper with my, my jump rope and my handle speed. So again, the process of making errors on your way towards excellence is a necessary step in your journey as an athlete. Our third principle is unfatigued practice. So basically, when you're learning a new skill, you need to make sure that you have zero accumulated fatigue when you're actually going to attempt that new skill. So for example, I see this all the time where people are kicking up into a handstand, they fail, and they kick right back up again and try right away. It's like, dude, just like chill out wait a second, like allow yourself to actually recover before you kick back up. Um, this happens all the time. It's like when you're doing skill work, the goal, if you don't have this skill yet, is not to try to like do it when you're unfatigued and just try to make as many attempts as you can. The goal is to make the best quality attempts that you possibly can. Um, and the way that you do that is you rest as long as you need to so that you feel 100% before you make your next attempt. That's going to allow you to have the best quality practice. Next, let's move on to double unders as our skill. Um, I have three sample sessions, and for each of them, I have an avatar that's related to it. Uh, the first one is going to be the most beginner. The third one is going to be the least beginner, but I'd all consider them to be learning the skill. So this first avatar, um, they're basically able to complete not more than a few double unders at a shot. So they trip very frequently. They're, they're basically lucky if they can string a few together. Um, so the timing and the coordination is really the thing that's holding them back at this point. And, um, overall, you know, they don't have a lot of other things that are going to be holding them back in terms of they have decent bounding tolerance where they can actually handle, um, you know, doing multiple sessions a week. And I would have this athlete perform this type of session three to four days per week consistently until they actually acquire double unders consistently. So here's their session starts off with Tabata single unders. Tabata is just eight rounds of 20 seconds of work, 10 seconds of rest. So basically just prep work for bounding. And then they're actually going to go into the things that are going to develop their, their timing and their coordination of their double under. So it starts off with supersets of speed steps and pogo hops. So speed steps are where you're basically like, it'll look like you're running in place um, and then moving your rope at kind of the speed that you would move your, your rope for double unders, hopefully. Um, that helps kind of disassociate your, your wrist action from your jump um, and helps you to just develop that feel of the rope a little bit better. Pogo hops are just to help you be able to feel what the bounding mechanics should look like and be able to start to work on being able to feel relaxed in the air, long, kind of let the legs hang in the air um, while you're doing that. Next, they'll move on to another superset of penguin hops and a double down drill. So penguin hops where you jump into the air and slap your thighs twice when you're in the air to help you feel and you'll be able to actually hear what it should sound like when you're doing double unders. So you'll jump in the air and it'll be like... And you'll be able to actually hear that sequence and it should be obviously quicker than that because you're doing double unders, but that's sort of the idea is that you hear that sequence happening and then you try to mimic that speed that's required when you're doing your double down drill. So double down drill, you're holding your jump rope and you're flicking your wrists down twice. Your thumbs are going down in succession in quick succession, just like you'd be doing double unders, but you're not actually jumping. So you're literally just holding your jump rope, standing in place and moving your thumbs down like that and that wrist action. And then lastly is where you actually go into your double under attempts. The way I write this is a 10 minute EMOM. 
of 25 seconds of double under attempts. So I find that most people, when they trip a double under, they want to get right back into it, like not doing that on fatigue practice, like I mentioned before. So what I like to do is say like, hey, you can make as many attempts as you want in that 25 second window, but then you have to rest the rest of that 35 seconds until the top of the minute. I find that the reason I kind of landed on 25 seconds is because if I write 15 or 20 seconds of skill work, um, and actually just like, hey, you can only work that time. People will let that bleed into the 30 second mark. Um, or if I just give them, you know, 30 or 35 seconds, they're tired by the time they go back to the top of that minute. So for a lot of my my CrossFit athletes, they're decently in shape. They can handle that and they want to be able to do this. So 25 seconds is sort of that sweet spot that I landed on. And then you will rest the remainder of the minute. Our second avatar, this is someone who's moderately consistent when doing double honors, but only when they're unfatigued. Um, so really, I think when they're, because they sort of have a poor body line when they're actually jumping, it doesn't really lend itself to being able to execute these in higher sets in workouts. Um, and really, this is due to their poor body line. So they kind of are the person who kind of pikes at their hip a little bit, pulls their knees up a little bit as they're jumping. So they're not able to actually have the technique that's necessary and the relaxation that's necessary for them to be able to perform bigger sets of double unders and workouts. Um, Again, for this type of athlete, I'm going to have them do this session two to three times per week. So the session is starting off with um, 200 single unders. Um, you know, if they trip, it's not a big deal, but just kind of moving through those. And then a superset of penguin hops and double unders. So again, the penguin hops, as I described before, jumping, slapping your thighs twice in the air. The idea is that they're kind of punching their feet into the ground. And this is actually the coach's notes that I have here is that they're focused on punching your feet into the floor and producing a quick rebound. And then when you're in the air, staying tall and relaxed and letting the legs quote hang in the air, right? So that's kind of the, one of the ways that I kind of describe this language is thinking about let your legs hang when you're sort of in that hang time. Like think about almost squeezing your thighs or just letting your legs hang in the air, trying to be as relaxed and as tall as possible. Um, and that sort of is, especially when you're not holding a rope, it's a lot easier to do that. So the, the penguin hops are something that really encourages you to stay in that nice, long, tall body line. And most athletes can do that, especially if they have a few double unders. Then after each one of those, so it's eight sets of eight for those penguin hops. So it's a lot of sets. And the idea is that you're flip-flopping that with a, a moderate set of double unders, maybe 15 or 20. And while you're doing those double unders, again, it's the exact same focal point. So again, it's focusing on letting the legs hang on the air and being as long and relaxed as possible, mimicking your penguin hops. You're trying to make them as much like the penguin hops as you possibly can because you should have been able to do those with the ideal technique because it's a lower skill movement. And then lastly, you're moving to double unders in a corridor. So basically you stack boxes where it's it's like you're doing like double unders in like a narrow hallway where you're forced to bring your hands in towards your hip right so a lot of people again if they have issues with body lines because they're also carrying a ton of tension through their shoulder or tricep um, and even grip and as you start to force them and bring their hands closer to their body it often happens to be where they naturally naturally relax a little bit more as a result so you start with those boxes really wide you bring them in over time and you know maybe start them at like 45 inches you move them into 40 move them into 38 and slowly that they are forced to bring those hands in towards their hips and have and hold a better body line and better hand position our third avatar is this someone who now they can kind of consistently hit 25 to 50 reps when they're unfatigued so they're pretty consistent when they're unfatigued and they can hit pretty decent sets um, however, the skill is not fatigue resistant, right? Meaning that when they're in workouts, they will tr uh, frequently trip. Um, they're unable to perform consistently in workouts, as I mentioned before. And for this athlete, I'd probably bring down the frequency a bit for them. I'd probably only have them do a session similar to this, maybe two times per week. And because likely if they're already fairly consistent, they're going to get sort of the adaptation they need from something that's twice per week. So starting off with five continuous rounds of 20 speed steps and 20 single unders, Again, playing with the rope speed, playing with your foot positioning, making sure that the hands can also move at different speeds and just kind of getting that whole system prepped. And then they're doing three to five um, sets of a rope acceleration across 15 to 25 reps. So basically you start at sort of a higher jump, slower rope speed, and slowly you bring down the jump height as you speed up, accelerate the rope. And um, that's basically teaching you to be able to do double unders faster. Then it's actually sort of more of a conditioning based piece because again, that's what this athlete needs. It's 10 to 12 sets of an eight calorie air bike and 20 double unders. The little asterisk next to the air bike 
It's supposed to be at a relaxed pace. And then you only increase across those sets as you keep those double unders unbroken. So the goal is to have unbroken double unders and then bring up the bike wattage as you can sustain that. You'll rest to eight out of 10 recovery between those rounds and then you'll repeat. So those are the double under sessions. If you're someone who is interested in more about double under development, I did that exact topic as episode number 10 of the fitness movement. So be sure to check that out. All right, principles that I'm pulling from these double under sessions. First principle is frequency and duration. So I personally think that frequency, in other words, the number of times that you're doing these skill sessions in a week is one of the most powerful use tools that you can use for a highly coordinated movement. So something like double unders are obviously a highly coordinated movement where the timing is really important for you to be able to get that right. Um, to me, a highly coordinated movement is something where the timing, the coordination is a more important for the success of that movement than strength or speed, which again, something like, you know, being able to figure out touch and go power cleans, you might not need to practice those as frequently at a certain percentage because you'd have to actually recover in between those. And depending what systems are involved when you're actually doing that, again, that might not be your best line of action, but for something that's more coordinated, right? Like throwing a baseball. If it's not maximal, you could do that every single day and it's only going to help you get better, right? If you're snatching, you could learn to, to move an empty barbell and be able to figure out how to snatch really well if you do that every single day um, or at least at a very high frequency. So again, you want to do things like snatching more than you're going to be deadlifting. You want to be able to do double unders more frequently than you do high intensity max effort sprint sessions, um, things like that. So for the, the CrossFit athletes that I coach, if I'm having them learn new skills, again, if it's something that is more coordinated, I want them probably doing that around three times per week, right? So again, if I'm having an, an athlete learn how to handstand walk or learn how to do double earners, I'm really kind of prioritizing that in their training. I would really like to see them at three days per week or even more, right? I have people, if they can handle it, they can do that almost every day. And that's only going to help you uh, in kind of improve your rate of learning. So that's frequency. The other side of that is duration, right? So you kind of have to have these play out correctly where if you do something every single day, the duration of that thing is probably going to be pretty insignificant. Like if you practice double unders every single day, it's probably never going to be more than like 10 or 15 minutes at a shot. Otherwise, you're just going to have sore calves constantly. So in terms of duration, some things that I would think about. Number one, you have to give yourself enough time where you can sort of actually get into deep practice where you can actually have... Um, you know, enough time to be able to warm up, to be able to prep all your tissues that you need and actually be able to get focused into the rhythm of practicing. And that takes a few minutes to sort of get into that. Um, and then I would say like, you also want enough time where you can experience a little bit of fatigue and a little bit of frust a frustration. Like you want to push past that initial fatigue and then that initial frustration that is going to come along with skill practice. And then, um, I would say also you want to stop before it gets to the point where that starts to feel overwhelming. Right. So you don't want to get to the point where you feel like really beat down or beat up or discouraged um, or just kind of to the point where your physical structures are actually compromised. So you don't want to go to the point where um, you practice so many double unders that your calves are just destroyed the next day where you practice so many beat kits or ring muscle ups that your shoulders are really kind of cranky the next day. Um, again, that's obviously not going to be beneficial for you making, you know, kind of progressive gains down the road. Principle number five is isolation versus integration. So when you're starting to learn a new movement, you want to do as many things as you can to make that in isolation, right? So you want to make it unfatigued. You want to make it as simple and straightforward and as you know consistent rep of rep or attempt over attempt as you could possibly can be. Um, basically bringing down the complexity of everything to make it where it's like foolproof and you can be able to actually recognize what's going on in the, in the actual movement and the individual components of that single skill. However, as we know, that's not the way things are tested in CrossFit and that's not the way that life often throws that, uh, things at us as well. So you're going to slowly move that movement into integration. So you're going to start to make things a little bit more complex. You're going to have it be more moving parts. Um, I think this is probably best explained through two quick examples. So an example of isolation would be that um, beginner EMOM that I just gave you for someone learning their double under. So an EMOM for 10 minutes of 25 seconds of double under attempts. That'd be isolation. Integration would be something that's moving them towards what they're actually preparing for. The goal is not just to do double unders for this person. It's to be able to do double unders 
in a number of variety of Metcons, right? So for them, integration could be something that's moving towards them, towards that, that Metcon goal, or it might be like every two minutes for six sets, we have them do six snatches at 95, 65, six bar facing burpees, and then max double unders until the one minute mark. So they rest another minute and then they repeat for six total times. Okay, so next let's go over our ring muscle up skill sessions. So the avatar for this one, it's a, a person who finished in the top 80% of the open. And this person has definitely has the prerequisite strength. Um, they have 12 plus uh, pull ups and they have 10 plus strict ring dips um, with a full range of motion, which obviously is a critical component. And um, the other thing is that obviously this person has never actually completed a successful ring muscle up, but they do have the, again, the prerequisite strength to be able to handle swinging and kipping work um, two times per week. And they haven't had any like, you know, real issues that have arisen from that. And they've also just had like minimal exposure and time on the rings. And as people who have ring muscle ups understand or have had spent some time on the rings, the rings obviously move completely differently than something like a bar. A bar is fixed in space. The rings actually move back and forth. So it just is necessary for them to get more exposure on how they can manipulate the rings and move them around and how to control them rather than being reactive and just, you know, being thrown all over the place. So the skill progression here, um, the session starts off with some movement prep. I'm not going to go over it. You can look at it in the spreadsheet if you prefer. Uh, the first superset is a low ring transition. So basically feet on the floor, low rings, like you're going to do a low ring, like a ring row, but you're passing through a dip um, and like basically pulling through the, the middle transition part of a ring muscle up uh, in a neutral grip. So you're not using a false grip, you're transitioning the entire system of your hand over top of the rings. You're super setting that with a deep ring dip. So that's a body weight dip, the full range of motion. Again, just being able to get that feeling and that, that full range of motion prep work. Next, they're going to go into a butt banded ring muscle up. So you connect a band from one ring to the other ring. You sit on it like it's like a swing and you do that exact same transition. But now your body's actually suspended and your feet are out in front of you in space. So it mimics a ring muscle up even more. Um, they're doing three sets of three of that. And then you'll go into jumping ring muscle ups. So a jumping ring muscle up, it doesn't mimic a ring muscle up, a kipping ring muscle up. And the fact that you're moving vertically uh, through space with your feet underneath you, because that's not how your kip would actually work. But what it does mimic and kind of teaches the athlete really well is how to catch in the bottom of a ring muscle up and how it's going to feel to feel your full body weight when you catch in that dip and actually be able to press out the entire weight, because obviously they can do the entire ring dip from that point. Um, so the jumping ring muscle up, and then they'll go into ring beat kips. So they'll move the, the rings up to the full height. They'll do ring beat kips. Again, that's no different than a beat kip on a bar, but the timing and feel of that is completely different. And then lastly, they're going to be doing cast swings, which is a way that you're actually going to mount onto rings when you do your mu muscle up. And then they're going to do a hipster ring. So cast swing into a hipster ring. Mo realistically, most people are not going to get all the way with their hips up to the rings, or they would probably just be able to do a muscle up. But you're, the goal is to do six to eight singles, getting your hips as close to the rings as you possibly can making sure you're resting fully between. I have some assistance work after that. Again, you can look up uh, the spreadsheet and the entire progression. I have like a six week or, week or eight week progression there. You can look it up again, the show notes, zorfitness.com slash podcast slash 057. Okay, principle number six is whole versus part learning. <laughs> so the simple way to say this is like, are you doing the actual skill? Or are you doing a drill that's supposed to help you be able to eventually do the actual skill. So preferably, if possible, do the actual movement, right? So if we have someone and they can do one ring muscle up consistently, I'm going to have them, yes, do some ring muscle up drills and transition drills and that sort of thing. But the bulk of what they're going to be doing is just starting to accumulate reps because as you accumulate reps, you will begin to refine that movement and make it more efficient as a result. So for someone who already has, again, singles of ring muscle ups consistently, I might start them with something like this. Every 75 seconds for 12 so total sets, you're doing one ring muscle up. So you're doing a single every 75 seconds, or maybe it's every 90 seconds, and you're starting to accumulate that. Maybe week one, it's uh, 12 reps, maybe week two, it's 15, 18. You start to build that out. Um, again, as long as they're consistent and they're not missing reps, continue to build that volume. Um, it's only going to help them learn the movement. If that's not possible, right, they don't have a single of a ring muscle up yet, then you're going to have to do drills, right? Because there's not an option to, um, you know, really mimic that movement completely accurate unless you are actually doing the movement. 
And there's, you know, there's other movements where that's not necessarily the case, but in this case, that is the case. So, you know, it's obviously not possible for them to do the entire rep, but you want to do things that mimic that as closely as you possibly can. So things like a partner spotted kipping ring muscle up, where they basically just do a ring muscle up just like they normally would. However, the, there's someone there who can basically give them a little boost through the middle transition part, like the power phase of the movement, and really just be able to get their center of mass just a touch higher where they can turn over and be able to actually press out and be able to actually complete a ring muscle up. Again, things like that butt banded ring muscle up are gonna mimic that really closely, or even like low ring transitions where your feet are out in a box out in front of you so they're elevated. And again, that's what it's gonna feel like when you have to compress and kind of do that sit up as you transition out of that ring muscle up. All of those things, are gonna be much better in terms of being able to translate to the actual movement than doing drills where you're doing like hollow body arches and things like that on the floor. Not that that stuff's not important that you shouldn't drill it, but you wanna, again, if you're thinking about trying to learn a new skill, you wanna do everything that you possibly can to do that actual skill, right? Um, so always try to favor whole over part learning as much as you possibly can um, before you actually learn the movement. Our next principle is the principle of transfer. The principle of transfer says the more identical two tasks are, the more carryover is likely to take place. So for example, two movements that are very similar, like a handstand hold and a handstand walk. So if you can learn how to handstand hold, you are very likely to learn how to handstand walk. And if you can handstand walk without handstand holding, you probably will improve your handstand walking by learning how to handstand hold, right? There's like a synergistic effect that takes place. Likewise, if you're someone who's never done a, a muscle up of any kind and you learn how to do a bar muscle up, you're far more likely to figure out how to do a ring muscle up as a result. Again, they're not the same movement, but certainly the skills that are required and the, the, the systems that are necessary to do well and have success in the one is also going to translate and carry over principle of transfer to another movement that's very similar. So if you learn to reclaim the hook grip when you're cycling cleans, it's also very likely that you'll be able to learn how to reclaim the hook grip as you're coming down when you're cycling your snatches. And principle number eight is critical systems for success. So these are the the key systems that are actually necessary for you to learn a new movement, it's like the, the components that are going to be required for you to actually have success. So for example, in a ring muscle up, it could be like your strict pulling strength. It could be your uh, ring stability and pressing strength. It could be your uh, overhead shoulder flexion. So like the arch position in the ring muscle up, it could be your, your shoulder extension. So that being able to get deep into the dip with your elbow going back behind your body. Um, it could be your your tolerance of actual kipping movements and just like your your rotator cuff strength and uh, resiliency, like all of those things are going to really matter when in terms of I need to be able to practice this in the correct amount of frequency and actually be able to attempt enough reps and also have a high probability of success when I actually do um, these sessions. And then we could look at something like double unders where it's still going to have critical systems, but those critical systems are obviously going to shift. So we might have one athlete who is maybe an ex field sport athlete where they're springy, they're resilient, they're uh, well rusted and well covered. They have good soft tissue quality. It's going to allow them to practice a lot of double unders and to learn that skill relatively quickly as a result. Versus if we have someone else and maybe they're older, they're less recovered. They have a lot of stress in their life outside training. Um, they're more, they're less elastic, right? They're basically just slower to recover. They're not going to be able to adapt to that as quickly because they don't have all the critical systems that are necessary for that skill to develop. And lastly, I want to go over barbell cycling. So this avatar is a person who's more experienced and they're high le higher level athletes. So this might be the top 2% of the open. There's someone who their, their lifts are pretty technically sound. There's not a very, a lot of variation rep over rep. They're consistent. Their full lifts are sound technically, and they're sort of in their foundational phase of uh, their season. So this is sort of pre-competition phase, maybe before the open. And then the pr likely they'll also get into at least quarterfinals in their season. So this could be just be, you know, one piece of a larger session that I'm going to read here in these sample sessions. Um, and also these are kind of a linear. If you look at the progression in the spreadsheet, you're going to see that it's not like it's a progression that you would typically see, like where it's going to be the exact same movements or exact same rep schemes. And it's a little bit more heavier. It's a little bit different, whatever. Like this is a linear, like it's completely different every single time. It's almost like you would see like random Metcons, but this is sort of a varied barbell cycling, let's call it. And just for a little bit of context, this athlete's 1RM clean and jerk is 315. Their 1RM snatch is 255. 
So for this one, I actually want to state the principle and then we'll go over the sample session. So principle number nine is variable or you might refer to as random practice versus blocked practice. So blocked practice is basically saying like you're doing one skill and then you'll stop that one skill and move to a different skill and practice that skill. So for it's if you know if it's someone doing basketball, you might see them shooting three throws and then they stop doing that. They'll move to doing layups and then they'll practice that for a period of time and they'll stop that and then they'll move to doing three pointers right? That would be sort of blocked practice. In CrossFit, that could be like snatch five by three at 75%, drop and reset between. It could be then B, you move on to squat clean and split jerk seven by two, 78%, drop and reset between, right? And then week two is sort of the same exercises, the same sets and reps, and maybe it's tweaked a little bit, right? Where maybe it's, you know, you drop a rep and the weight goes up a little bit, or it's just slightly heavier, whatever, right? You get the idea. Now, if we compare that to variable practice, variable practice, you're going to see a lot more novelty. It's going to be much more um, a linear in nature, right? Where there's a lot more moving parts. It's not like you do one thing and then you stop that and move to the next thing. So rather than, you know, going from three throws to three pointers to practicing your dribbling skills and basketball, it's going to be like you're scrimmaging, right? You're mixing all those things together. And as a result, it mimics what you're going to be doing on your game day a whole lot closer. In CrossFit, this could just be like, doing cross hit in the way that it's tested, right? Like mixing up different varieties of movement, different movement pairings, different time domains, whether it's strength based event versus an endurance based event, like you're going to see all these different things. You're going to start to vary those things more because you don't know what you're going to see, right? And that not, might, might not be the best way to progress from a scientific perspective in terms of training. However, in certain times of your year, especially for a more advanced athlete, that's really necessary in CrossFit training. So in episode number 33 of the fitness movement, I talked about balancing structure and variety in CrossFit training. Again, you can check that one out if you're interested in more from that one. But I want to go over the sample sessions uh, for barbell cycling. This first one, at 0, 0, 0, so you're starting a clock. It's 30 seconds of max squat snatch at 95 pounds. Light barbell cycling. At 3, 0, 0, it's 30 seconds of max squat cleans at 135. At 6 minutes... It's 30 seconds of max squat snatch at 135. At 10 minutes, it's 30 seconds of max squat clean at 185. At 14 minutes, it's 30 seconds of max squat snatch at 185. And in 18 minutes, it's 30 seconds of max squat clean at 225. Our second example is from 0, 0, 0 to 10 minutes on the clock. You have that time to build to a 4RM touch and go push jerk. Touch and go push jerk to me just means that you're not allowed to pause in the front rack. You go from overhead back to overhead in a single motion. So build a 4RM push jerk from zero to 10, from 13 to 23 on the clock. You're going to do that is a 10 minute EMOM. Minute number one is going to be 10 power snatches and 10 bar facing burpees. Obviously that's really dense work. So the second minute, the odd or sorry, the even minute, you're going to be doing 45 seconds of rowing at a recovery pace. So basically one's a ton of work, power snatches, bar facing burpees, two is rowing at a recovery pace. And then at 26 minutes, you're going to be doing 20 squat clean thrusters at 155 for time. Okay. So basically you can see that in those two sessions, they're completely different. They both required qualities of barbell cycling. They both involve some of the same movements, but again, there's varied exposures there. It's variable practice. And then lastly, principle number 10 is feedback loop length. So the longer a feedback loop is, in other words, how long it takes for you to get feedback, the slower your rate of improvement will be. So something that has a really long feedback loop might be like sending a video to a remote coach, the remote coach maybe takes some time to look at it, and then they're going to send cues back to you. That could be hours or days. Um, minutes might be like filming yourself while you're doing a skill and in between sets of that skill, looking at it and reviewing yourself. I'll call that like deep practice, right? Um, seconds might be just like a coach that's in person, be able to like yell to you and call out a cue when you're in the moment to help you recognize what's going on. Um, fractions of a second would be you being able to actually detect in your own movement in real time the errors that you're making and be able to adjust those on the fly. So that feedback, you gotta think about it, is, is fractions of a second. The, the process rate that that can happen is so fast. Like you can tell rep over rep if your snatches are just a little bit out in front. You can tell rep over rep if you're pulling a little bit too early in that uh, ring muscle up. 
all those are really good examples of how to, you can self-correct those micro errors that are occurring. And really, again, that's about developing feel as an athlete to be able to be able to get your best performance and be able to improve as quickly as you possibly can. So it's really important for athletes to be able to take ownership of their own feedback as an athlete and learning skills as well. So there you have it. Those are our 10 principles of motor learning. Let's review. Number one was intention and focus. Two, making errors. Three, unfatigued practice. Four, frequency and duration. Five, isolation versus integration. Six is whole versus part learning. Seven was the principle of transfer. Eight was critical systems for success. Nine was variable versus blocked practice. And 10 was feedback loop length. Remember these principles and put them into practice and you'll know how to learn any CrossFit skill. Hey, it's Ben again. Thanks for listening today. To be completely honest, it's been really rewarding to have people who listen to the show regularly reach out to me, whether they have a question about training or just to say, hey. So if you haven't done that yet, do it. I'm pretty good about getting back to people and you can feel free to email me, ben at sorefitness.com or message me on Instagram at sorefitness. And graciously, I've had some people reach out to me and ask how they can support the show. Number one way that you can support the show if you are a regular listener is just by rating the show. Most apps have a platform where you can actually rate it and on Apple Podcasts, you can write a review as well. This is super helpful in having other coaches and athletes find the podcast, but also just having it grow and for me to continue to want to put out more and more content. Also, I'm going to be posting more full episodes of the Fitness Movement to our YouTube channel. So if you're someone who actually enjoys seeing my face when I talk, you can head over to YouTube and subscribe if you please. And if you're someone who is watching on YouTube, you have the ability to like our videos, but then you can also comment on the video if you have questions about the episode or if you want to suggest a topic for a future episode. And lastly, if you're someone who really does value what we're putting out, I would encourage you to hire a coach. For me, coaching is the bulk of my job and it's what I believe I do best. So if you're an athlete or a coach looking to up your fitness game, be sure to reach out. You can message me on Instagram at Zora Fitness or email me ben at ZoraFitness.com. Thanks again for listening today. And as always, stay the course.